I want to thank everybody that is here today, but I also want to thank for the people of this church who put their time and effort into the ministry of this church, so thank you. Every little part helps. And I want to say hi to Teresa. We love you, Teresa. Good to see you. And Tatiana, her daughter. So, yeah, summertime brings a time where people leave, they're busy, but then they come back in the fall. So I'm very excited for the new season of the year. And I'm going to share with you in word. It's going to be, I call it layman terms. I'm going to speak to you like Jesus spoke to everybody in the Bible which is pretty simple. I am a simple guy, okay? I am not one of the preachers that are like T.D. Jakes or Trevor Harris where they're just amazing talking, okay? I don't articulate real well, but I'm real, okay? And what you get with me, I'm the same all the time. I have my freak out moments. I have my holy moments. And, uh, but you know what? I'm real, okay? I don't come to church, put on a face, Okay, so today's message is going to be talking about where are you really, okay? Not what you want people to think where you're at, but where are you really? And that's a hard thing to do because when people, when you go to church, you put on your church face. People go, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. But really, you're hurting inside. So we need to be a community of believers here that are real, but be real at the right time and the right moment. Okay? Amen. So let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 10, 27 to 30, excuse me, 25 to 37. And the title of my message is called The 17 Mile Journey. Okay? Why do I call it? Because I, I know you guys heard this story, but it's so profound. And I see where the church, this church is going right now. We're going on a topic of love, okay? Because what we see in the world today is really scary, okay? And you all can agree. We, um, I love the media. I'm on Facebook all the time. Half the time it depresses me because the media, even the news, they focus on the negative. And if you let that spirit of negativity go inside you, you will become cynical and you will just have a bad attitude because you'll be so worried about everything else, and you will forget that God Amen. is in charge of everything. Amen. He knows exactly what he's doing at all times. So don't put God in a box and saying, oh, I can't believe he doesn't know. You no, know, he knows what's going on. He knows who the president is. He knows everything. He knows what's going on in Texas. Okay, but we have a calling and a duty as a believer to do something supernatural and special in this world. Okay, your life is not your own. Amen. So don't think that you can make all these plans Amen. because God wants you to be part of his plan. Amen. Okay, you're here on this earth for a very short period of time. You better make something happen, okay, because you're responsible for your life here. So 17-mile journey. The story is about a parable about the Good Samaritan. Very famous parable, parable means story. But it's interesting because all Jesus' parables always had very different levels of meaning to it. 17 miles from Jerusalem to Jericho is 17 miles. And this is where the story takes place. From Shoreline to West Seattle is 17 miles. The type of road that this guy was on was like driving Highway 2 through the circles, okay? Started at 25 elevation feet down to 800, okay? So you're talking a lot of windy road, dark road, okay? So when we go over the story today, I always do this with myself, is I put myself in the story because it becomes reality to me. I get a whole different meaning to it. So let me read. And then we are going to talk about four characters in the story. And I want you to pick out the character where you are right now. Okay? Well, so let's begin. 
On an occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. I like when people do that. Like that's going to do any good. Teacher, he asked, what uh, must I do to inherit eternal life? Number one is, why are you asking this guy even that question? Probably because he doesn't know who he is. Okay? He just calls him teacher. Okay? What is written in the law? He replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. I love this part. When someone asks you a question, you reply with a question. I do that with my wife all the time. All the time. She goes, how does this make me look? And I'll go, well, how do you think you look? <laughs> Men, take lesson. You will always win. You will never have to give reality of the truth. You let your woman figure it out. Right? Yeah. Okay, but he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Mm -hmm. And, re and uh, replied, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, 17 miles. When he fell in the hands of robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. And a priest happened to be going down the same road. And we saw the man, he passed by the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place, he saw him pass by the other side. But a Samaritan, okay? So what is a Samaritan to the Jews? Samaritan's a dog. They're the low, the low. They hated the Samaritans. If you were, if you were prejudiced against a race, it would be the race that you're against, okay? So it's interesting. This is a very many levels here, what, what we have to do with today's reality. I call this modern-day reality right here, and especially it has to do with today. Culture, race, religion, okay? Nothing's changed. You would think it changed. I think it's gotten worse, okay? I feel like I'm in an alternate reality when I'm walking out there. You can't say anything about anything because it's not politically correct. You know, you can't say anything religious because you're not politically correct. You know, and so if you look at what reality of today is, reality of today is that Satan is having a heyday. Let's push hate. Let's push everything is the opposite of Jesus. Okay, nothing has changed. But Jesus is bringing to our attention to this. So when we can read this story today, he said, yeah, this is reality. Okay, because the, the lawyer was probably a Jew. Okay, you're, you're going to ask Jesus a question, okay, and he already knows the answer. He will ask you a question. The Holy Spirit will ask you a question, and you already know what the answer is. So why are you asking? Okay. And he went to him. Oh, here we go. Levi, when he came to plant, uh, pass on the other side, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you have. Which of these three, I want you to really look at this question here. What Jesus is saying. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? And this is the answer of the lawyer. Okay, see if you know where I'm going with this. The expert and the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. But let's look like that again. The one who had mercy 
Why didn't the lawyer say Samaritan? Why didn't he say that? Because he couldn't stand them. Even after he was given the answer of what to do, he still had an issue with it. He still, his heart would not be changed. So let's talk about the four characters that have to deal with this story. Okay? The one, first one is a lawyer who was probably a Jew. Now, I don't know about you, but I know certain people who talk like lawyers. Anybody know about that? They can articulate. Extremely smart. Maybe multiple, multiple degrees. They love to argue about everything. They have a rebuttal for everything. You know? I don't know if they teach you that at lawyer school or you're just born with it. But I think some people were born with it. Okay? So if you go back to the beginning of the story, you have this guy, this lawyer. So picture this guy, really smart, articulate. He knows the law. He knows the Torah. He knows the five books of the Old Testament. He's probably got it all memorized. Okay? And he wants to argue with Jesus. Okay? He's a teacher. Probably doesn't know who Jesus is. Okay? And the interesting thing is, is that he already knows what the answer is. The lawyer already knows what the answer is. So why is he asking the question? Why is he asking a question? For a simple reason. He's trying to find a loophole to fit his own theology in his own world. Okay, that's what he's trying to do. So you have to picture this. What type of person is this in the church? This type of person knows the Bible really well. They may even go church to church. Maybe they don't even have a home church. They just go to church to church. They know it really well. They can talk the Bible with anybody. They got all the verses memorized. They can talk the lingo. But they have excuse. The lawyer issue not only was he smart, he had a lot of head knowledge, but he had an excuse. He's full of excuses. Not, he already knew what it is. If we know what the Word says, we know what the Holy Spirit tells us to do, most people will always try to find a loophole of not doing what we're supposed to do. Amen? We find an excuse not to get involved in our church. We find an excuse... Not to change something in our personal life. We find an excuse not to be the spiritual leader of the family or can take control of a situation. People are full of excuses. Okay? The opposite of an excuse to me is faithfulness. Okay? If you know what it is, do it. Quit coming up with excuses not to do. I'd rather you tell me where you are at personally than you come and tell me excuses why you're not here. Right? Isn't that reality? If, you know, what happened in the day of the olden days where you made a commitment to somebody, your word was your bond, you said you would do something, and you followed through with that. What happened to that? I don't see that much today. I have people that don't take people seriously. You know, Jesus wants faithfulness. He doesn't want excuses. He wants you to be real, but he wants you to follow through. And this lawyer knew what the answer was. It's like people that go around, they got an issue, and they go around all their friends in church trying to get them on board with the same thing that they're going through. What's your advice? Oh, I don't like that one. I'll go with this one. What's your advice? No, I don't like that one. Oh, you like, oh, we're on board. Okay, I'm going to take your advice. Well, what's the vice of the Word of God? What's truth? You either you live through the truth or you don't. Either you're faithful or you're not. Right? And Jesus was making a point. You know what the truth is. You know what you have to do. You've memorized the Word. Just follow it. Don't give me excuses. You know? That's what he says. That's what he said right here. How do you read it? Same thing. What does the Holy Spirit tell you? Yeah, 
I can do that. Well, then do it. You know? So it's character one. There's a lot of people out there that are in character one. Trust me, I have been all these characters we're going to discuss today. At least one or two seasons of my life. When I first started coming to this church 20 years ago, I was character one. I sat, actually I've been sitting in the same pew for 20 years. Man! And I, I was great. I warmed that pew every time I sat in here. I was faithful to church Wednesday nights, but I was not faithful to step out of my box and do something for his kingdom. That's what he wants. We are all called to do something. Right? Right. Character number two. I'm going to have to say the character number two is the man that was robbed. Let's go there. And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Where can we build that character in the body of Christ? I'm going to say this character is the average person. The average person that is hurting. That's what I'm going to say. You got people walking through the doors. You don't make any effort to get to know who they are. And we have people that are hurting, people that are falling apart, and nobody even knows it. Because we are so stuck in our little world, in my little area, and we are not willing to go out and see how are you doing. Really? You're really going through this? Wow. I never knew. See, people can't share. But we have to have the Holy Spirit give us that compassion for people to be able to see through the wall and the things that they put up so we can reach out to them. People have so many issues. We have religious issues. We have sexual identity issues sexual preference issues. We have things that have deal with people's marriages falling apart. We are so quick to judge of what people are going through. Jesus never judged like that. You know what Jesus had? He had a listening ear, a compassion heart, and he wept. He wept for people. So he had compassion. Our job as a body of believers is to take more interest in the people that are hurting in our own community. Because this might be the only chance that they have. Only chance on a Sunday to show up and nobody reached out and talked to them. And they were hurting inside. And they can't figure things out in life. You know, they're in this and that. They want a safe place to come. They do. They want a place where there's no judgment. They can feel the love of Christ, and they can open up. That's what people are looking for. That's what they want from the church. They want a place where they can, people can be real, and you can love me for who I am. So that's the robber. That is the guy who got robbed, stripped of his clothes, beaten, leaving, and uh, leaving him half dead. It's a bad place to be in when you've hit rock bottom. Been there. It's a scary place to be. You don't have enough money to buy groceries. You don't have a job. Enough money to pay your bills. You're fighting with your spouse. Your whole world's falling apart. Okay? It's a bad place to be. And our church needs to be there for these people. My third person is the Levite. And the Levite, I put in as a modern-day pastor. But Jared was telling me that it says here that the Levite was walking, and he walked on the other side. So I'm going to put this in today's terminology, and this is, I used this the first service. How many people have driven down the freeway and you have seen somebody stuck on the side of the road? 
and you did nothing. <laughs> Why? Why didn't we do nothing? The only thing that I have, I have really no excuse except I, I see a real lot of weird things that happen with people that stop and help people. That's my only excuse I have, really, you know? So basically, I am still this character that has walked on the other side and has not stopped to help my person who's having an issue over there, you know, because, you know, we could use the excuse that they were afraid of robbers to get jumped, but no. So the Levite, what is the Levite? Levite is a religious person, uh, Old Testament, who worked with the priests. You had the priests, you had the Levites. They worked together. I would say the Levite was a mentor, uh, the priest mentor the Levite, but I'm going to use it today's terminology of a pastor, a modern day pastor, someone who's religious. And what is a pastor? A pastor of a church is a calling from God. What are pastors? They're supposed to act like shepherds by taking care of the flock. And they're supposed to be teachers, mentors, guiding their flock, training, protecting. You know, what are the characteristics of a pastor? My, uh, my code of conduct, how are you supposed to act, how are you supposed to be, is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. That is the code of conduct for a pastor the love chapter. Because I tell you, if we all follow that chapter, we wouldn't have any of these issues we have in this world today. True? It's amazing how love trumps everything. A pastor should always be the same at church and out of the church. Okay? When I see Pastor Trevor outside of church, He's exactly the same guy that I love in church. I love Pastor Trevor. Pastor Trevor's the first pastor I've ever met that showed Christ-like love 20 years ago. Came to this church. Never seen a pastor like him. Never been to a church like this where they spoke in tongues, and I thought it was really weird. And, uh, hey, I grew up conservative Baptist, right? We're all good statues. Okay. Didn't move in the spirit. Fell asleep in the services. But Pastor Trevor, to me, exudes love. I want my pastor, I want to be able to call him at 2 in the morning saying, hey, I'm stuck in the side of the road, can you help me? And Pastor Trevor would say, okay, I'm there. Okay? I want my pastor to be able to know who I am. I want his time to say, I need to talk to you. Yeah, let's talk. Okay? So the calling of a pastor is really way up there. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i hoping a pastor is just not full of head knowledge and no heart. Because there's a lot of pastors like that. They go to seminary. They learn all the facts and figures about everything in the Bible. But they have no heart. Okay? A pastor loves people. They have compassion for people. They make time for people. They listen to people. Just like Jesus does. Jesus loves you. He makes time for you. You know? I would like to see my pastor look like Jesus. It's a high thing, high standard. But that's what we were called to do. All of us. Okay? Not just pastors. Okay? As a youth pastor, I am called to do not things of the carnal flesh, not freak out on kids when you have to call them 42 times to do anything, you know. But what I'm saying is, is that this pastor, this Levite, this religious guy was walking on this other side of the road, and you know what? A lot of pastors are just too busy for their congregants. They got too many meetings, too many events, and they just don't have any time to talk to their people they're shepherding. And this Levite just had, he was just way too busy. Life was going too good. I don't have time. So I'm going to just walk on the other side of the road. I hope that we never have an attitude like that. 
that I'm just too busy to help out. Let's move on to our story here. And I'm going to put this in layman terms, put it in today's language. Okay? So we're going down Highway or I-5. We're heading out to West Seattle. Okay? Hopefully you get this because it's pretty simple. Okay? And uh, you're driving your car, and it, you're dead at the side of the road. Okay? Somebody comes by and helps you with your car, but they realize that the guys took all your money, have no place to stay. So what they're going to do is going to be like this guy here, the Samaritan. Samaritan, not the, you know, just an average person, but to the lawyer, it's the person that he hated. So it's ironic, the person that I don't like, the color of their skin, the way they talk, the way they look, is going to help me at the time of need. This guy's going to show me an example of how to be like Jesus. Samaritan, the Samaritan guy represents Jesus. Okay? You saw him. You went to him. He bandaged his wounds. He cleaned him up, put him in his car, his truck. He took him at the West End and said, take care of this guy. I'm going to pay the bill. Okay? I'm going to take care of it. Don't worry about it, dude. And then when I come back, we'll see how you're doing. That, to me, is the attitude that we all need to have the mindset and the heart that I'm going to help this person. I'm not going to limit myself, but I'm really going to help them. And that's what Jesus was trying to say. He says, the expert of the law replied, the lawyer said, then the one, the, the one who has mercy on him. Which of these three guys do you think it's the one who had mercy? But he wouldn't even mention his name. This guy from Samaria. He was making a point. And what was the point that Jesus was making? He just made it really clear. Go out and do it. Just go out and do it. And that Jesus wants us to do is go out. He says, who's my neighbor? Be a neighbor. Won't you be a neighbor? You know? And that's what we're doing uh, with our neighbors. We have some neighbors that are having some financial problems, and we've helped them out a little bit. You know? That's what Jesus wants. He doesn't want you to second-guess yourself. He doesn't want to say, well, if I give the money, where they can use it for? That's not the point. That's not the point. The point is just go out and do it. Let's close in word prayer. Lord Jesus, I just want to be just like you. I want to talk like you. I want to move in the spirit like you. I want to love like you. And I have no excuse except myself because myself gets in the way. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I ask that I quit being selfish with my own needs and put the needs of above other people. I want to be more of a servant. I don't want to look at people for who or what they look like. I just want to love on people. I thank you for the people that are here today, Lord. Our whole idea is when we say we are a Christian, people are going to say, yes, I can see it, you are. And that's what we want this church and our lives to look like. Pray for tonight, Lord. We thank you for the healings that have already been set up, Lord, for your glory. Bring the people here, Lord. We are anxious. We are willing to see what your glory has. We love you. We want to love you with our, all our heart, soul, and mind, Lord. In your name, amen. All right, guys, thank you. My family and guests, thank you for coming today. Please come here tonight for the healing service. Be here at 6.